Well, good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to the uh, first seminar in um, in the Pomp Core Seminar Series uh, uh, this semester. And this semester, we decided basically to uh, devote our uh, meetings to broadly defined international relations um, and security cooperation. So essentially, Poland in the global world, but obviously we have to go beyond Poland and we have to look at the region. We have to look at the continent. We, have, we, we also have to look at the, uh, uh, security uh, politics. And if one thinks about, uh, about Poland, it's uh, raison d'etat. Uh, its place in the region, then there is one specific country which obviously comes to mind, and this is Ukraine. Uh, so I'm very pleased actually to have two excellent speakers today. Um, uh, Wojciech Konończuk uh, uh, on my right, uh, who is a senior fellow at the Warsaw-based uh, Center for um, Eastern Studies, which is basically a leading Polish uh, think tank. Uh, uh, Wojtek is the head of the Department of Eastern Europe at the Center for Eastern um, Studies. Um, uh, his research focuses mainly on Ukraine, Belarus, as well as energy policy um, in Eastern Europe. Uh, he's also a regular contributor to New Eastern Europe Journal, as well as the Godin Powszechny Weekly from, uh, from Krakow. Um, and he will be basically the main speaker today, and the title of his talk is Why Ukraine Matters to Poland and the EU, without a question mark. I noticed. And then um, our discussion today is uh, Andrew Wilson, to my left, a professor in Ukrainian studies at University College London and a senior policy fellow um, at the European Council on Foreign uh, Relations. Um, Andrew published a lot uh, on, 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 Ukrainian, uh, on Ukrainian politics and society as well as post-Soviet uh, society and politics. Uh, most recently, I think, this is your book from 2014, which came by Yale University Press. Um, Ukraine Crisis. Ukraine Crisis, What the West Needs to Know. Terrible title. Well, I, I'm, trying to think about, I'm trying to think about John Gaddis' book, Now We Know, The Course of the Cold War. And I try to remember, basically, what, uh, what the late Tony Jatt, you know, had to say about this title. But Andrew also published um, The Last European Dictatorship, which is on Belarus, uh, The Ukrainians, Unexpected Nation uh, from, 2000, from 2009, Ukraine's Orange Revolution from 2005, and Virtual Politics, uh, Faking Democracy in the Post-Soviet uh, post World. Uh, he also contributes um, at the various, uh, to various papers and publications at the European Council on Foreign Relations. So we have two excellent experts today. And Wojtek, it all goes to you now. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Kunitsky, ladies and gentlemen. Doctor. Uh, Doctor Kunitsky, okay. Uh, thank you very much for, for having me here. It's a, a genuine, genuine pleasure uh, to, to share with you my understanding of the situation in Ukraine, uh, Polish-Ukrainian uh, relations, and why Ukraine is a significant country for Europe. Uh, I assume that your knowledge uh, about all this issue is uh, hi higher than average, but at the same time that majority of you are not experts on Ukraine. And on this uh, presumption I create the, the following structure of uh, my um, presentation. Um, in the introductionary part I would like to say a few words about uh, the origin of uh, Russian-Ukrainian conflict. Then to show some public opinion polls uh, presenting how quickly Ukrainian society became one of the most pro-European uh, on the continent. In the third part, uh, I'm going to give you some of my assessment uh, about situation development in Ukraine. It will be uh, a sort of uh, an attempt to, 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 to do a sort of uh, an audit of post-revolutionary uh, Ukraine. Uh, then I will argue why you should engage more um, in Ukraine uh, for the sake of its own uh, interests. And finally, um, I will present um, an important dimension of uh, Ukraine's foreign policy. It is uh, uh, Ukrainian-Polish um, uh, relations. Okay, let me start with a short uh, explanation why Russia did it, why Russia invaded Ukraine. Uh, the Maidan revolution uh, represented a very serious and unexpected uh, failure of, of, of Russian policy towards Ukraine. Uh, 
it was also it is very important. It was also a personal blow to to to, to Mr. to the prestige of Mr. of Mr. Putin. So uh, Russian invasion just a few days after uh, uh, ex-president Yanukovych escaped Kiev was a desperate attempt to regain influence uh, over Kiev. Uh, actually, uh, the Kremlin wanted a, a quick revenge. Um, and Crimea uh, provided the, the easiest source uh, uh, for Russia, the easiest leverage um, uh, against Kiev. After invading Crimea, Moscow hoped also to destabilize the whole southeast of Ukraine, uh, predominantly, predominantly Russian-speaking region from Kharkiv to uh, uh, through Dnipropetrovsk to Odessa. Here you can see uh, the 2001 census showing uh, how popular is Russian language uh, in the uh, south uh, uh, east part of Ukraine. So it's not an accident that Russia chose two regions, uh, three regions, Crimea, Lugansk, and Donetsk uh, regions, where Russia is uh, the, the most commonly speaking uh, uh, language. But due to many reasons, I don't have a time now to discuss it in details, uh, Russia, uh, Russia's attempt failed. Uh, Russia was successful uh, mm, uh, in just part of, 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 uh, of Donbass. Uh, on this slide you can see that uh, currently about 7% of Ukrainian territory is under de facto Russian occupation. Uh, Moscow's successful campaign in Crimea and, and then in, in, in Donbass provoked just a weak response from uh, from the West. Uh, it was a, a signal that, uh, that the West, being in shock, of course, uh, did, not, did not realize that the, the crisis is uh, far more important uh, than its regional uh, significance. Uh, the sanctions imposed uh, on Russia uh, just after uh, Crimea um, annexation perhaps was not just symbolic, but far too weak to stop Russian aggression. Uh, the U.S. and, 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 the, and the EU um, decided to impose on Russia more serious sanctions only after uh, Malaysian airline MH17 uh, flight was shut down in Donbass and after Russia invaded Donbass uh, by its regular troops in August 2014. So uh, what were Russian goals uh, towards the new Ukrainian government after the, after the Maidan? Uh, from, the, from the very beginning, um, Moscow tried to force Kiev to adopt an entirely new model of gover governance, uh, federal status, uh, which would grant it, uh, some Ukrainian region, especially Russia-controlled Donbass, uh, far-reaching political and uh, economic autonomy. So Russia calculates uh, that it will be able to obtain effective and long-term um, instruments over um, Ukraine's main strategic um, uh, decisions, including the question of integration with Western uh, structures like the EU and, and, and NATO. But uh, Ukraine has resisted Russian pressure, and even in spite of the, of the actually lost uh, war, but, but, but Ukraine, uh, Kiev uh, did not accept uh, Russian condition of, 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 of solve the, uh, the, the, the crisis. Of course, the cost of this resistance for, uh, for, for Ukraine are very high. Uh, the main industrialized Ukraine's region, it is uh, Donbass, is, is under de facto uh, Russian control today. And uh, uh, as much as one million and a half of uh, residents of Donbass were forced to leave their houses. Uh, IDPs are a serious uh, uh, problems for, for Ukraine. Here you can see a distribution of IDPs in Ukraine, Ukrainian uh, uh, regions. Uh, this problem of uh, IDPs in Ukraine is, is largely unnoticed still by the Western public opinion. Uh, Russia, uh, Russia aggression on Ukraine solved traditional dilemma uh, in Ukrainian uh, foreign policy. Should we, uh, should we choose European integration or rather stay with Russia? Uh, if you compare uh, the result of a, success, a successive Ukrainian uh, presidential elections, uh, which always from the very beginning were a clash between a, 
let's say, pro-European uh, candidates uh, and pro-Russian candidate of a candidate with pro-European and pro-Russian slogans, you will notice some, uh, some uh, very interesting trend. So have a look on, uh, on the result of 1994 elections um, uh, in Ukraine. Leonid Kuchma, orange color, uh, was perceived uh, as a rather pro-European. Kravchuk. Uh, sorry, uh, Leonid Kravchuk, as a rather uh, pro-European candidate. While uh, his rival Leonid Kuchma, um, on this map, uh, blue color, as more pro-Russian. Uh, pro, pro and it was he who was elected the, the president. In, 90, uh, uh, in 2004 uh, presidential election, Viktor Yushchenko, orange and yellow colors, uh, had a pro-European program, while his rival Yanukovych, blue color, um, rather uh, pro-Russian. Um, as you can see, a, a level of, 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 of support from the Ukrainian society uh, of pro-European candidate increased in comparison with the situation um, uh, 10 years earlier. And finally, the last uh, presidential election in Ukraine, 2004, won by Petro Poroshenko. Um, he received substantial support also in the southern and, and, and eastern regions, uh, which are uh, traditionally rather, who traditionally rather vote for um, can candidates with, with different programs. Uh, of course, partly it was a consequence of, uh, of uh, a lack of a serious rival of Mr. Poroshenko. But the main reason was, of course, um, Russian aggression, which fundamentally uh, changed the election map of, of Ukraine. And as you can see from the recent public opinion polls um, made uh, uh, in November uh, 2015, for the first time in, in, in Ukraine's history, integration with the EU uh, is supported by majority of Ukrainians, 57% of them think it's a good option to integrate with, with, with the EU. Uh, and at the same time, uh, support level of support for uh, integration with Russia-backed organizations like Custom Union is uh, on, the, uh, on the lowest level uh, in history. Uh, while Ukrainian uh, society is currently one of the most pro-European in Europe, uh, the level of, of anti-Russian sentiment uh, in Ukraine is at the, at the, is the highest in, in, in history. 59% uh, uh, of uh, Ukrainians have negative attitude towards Russia today, um, and uh, just 60% positive. So we are observing a process, very quick process of disintegration of uh, Russian, Ukrainian political, economic, social uh, ties. And just one example, here you can see uh, how quickly Russia degraded its position as uh, number one a foreign uh, partner um, uh, of Ukraine from uh, usually one third of Ukrainian exports uh, went to Russia, to, to Russia for, the, for the first 11 months of last year it was uh, almost 13 um, percent. Okay, uh, now I would like to, to focus on uh, domestic situation in Ukraine, especially on an attempt of, uh, of reforms uh, uh, after, after the Maidan. And uh, here you can see a starting point. Uh, Ukraine's GDP in 2014, according to the World Bank, in comparison with some other uh, post-Soviet countries, uh, I think that conclusion is quite obvious. Uh, Ukraine is one of the poorest nations, uh, not only on post-Soviet area, but also, uh, but also in Europe. It, it is mainly the effect of, um, of uh, two decades of lack of, of reforms or imitation of reforms. Uh, it would be, I think it would be impossible to find uh, such a big nation in Europe which needs um, uh, reform more than Ukraine today. Perhaps other example would be uh, Putin's Russia. Uh, the main reason of, of Ukrainian revolution was not only the opposition against uh, increasingly authoritarian rule of, of, of President Yanukovych, uh, but also lack of reforms. So uh, the Maidan revolution was not just a call for dem more democracy or democracy, uh, but in equal measures, I think it was a, it was a, a call for 
modernization of, of, of the country. So not surprisingly that after, um, after the Maidan, the elite which took power after the Maidan, uh, they put word um, reforms on their standards. Just two, just two examples of what, of what Mr. Poroshenko, after he was elected um, uh, president and prime minister Yatsenyuk, when he was elected, uh, Prime Minister, what they said about uh, about the about the election, about the about the, uh, about the necessity of of, of, of reforms. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it soon uh, it soon turned out that mm, there would be no uh, reforming blitzkrieg in uh, in the post Maidan uh, Ukraine. Uh, in the first months after just after uh, the, the revolution. A time when social mobilization and readiness, society readiness to bear the cost of reforms were at their highest. Uh, actually, very little happened. Uh, here you can see what uh, reforms, according to, to Ukrainians, are the most important. It's anti corruption reforms, judicial, judiciary, healthcare decentralization, and almost all spheres of, of, of state functioning. I don't have enough time to, to, to stop in details on uh, all this fear, of course, so uh, I choose just uh, five cases, which I think uh, um, shows uh, what is happening with reforms in uh, post, uh, post Maidan Ukraine. First, decentralization reform uh, was prepared, uh, which is necessary to create a, a properly functional, functioning local, uh, local uh, government structures. Uh, which is necessary to stimulate um, uh, uh, regional development. Uh, the, 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 the document, the, uh, the project of, of the centralization law, which was well received by, by the by, by majority of experts, it, in last August was successfully uh, passed in its first reading by the parliament. Uh, and the second reading um, uh, was scheduled uh, for late 2015. But um, it was postponed. The second reading was postponed uh, as the government predicted that it would uh, it would not be able to find sufficient uh, support from the uh, from the deputies. Uh, what is the reason? Uh, some member of the ruling coalition um, um, they are against this uh, decentralization uh, because uh, decentralization uh, bill. Uh, because uh, the project contains clauses on, I quote, the special way of functioning of local government in some district of Donetsk and, and Lugansk provinces. And according to, um, to those uh, Ukrainian MPs, this would open the way to give um, autonomy status for, uh, uh, for Donbass. And uh, these clauses, uh, which will include it to the decentralization law, um, are an implementation of the Minsk agreement. Um, and as we can see, it was a very bad idea to put to the one basket the question of decentralization reform with a question of a special, special status for, uh, uh, for, 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 Don, for Donbass because it's uh, de facto is blocking this important, crucial for Ukraine reform. Second case, it's anti-corruption. After the Maidan, two anti-corruption body uh, um, have been created, National Anti-Corruption Bureau and National Agency uh, for Preventing Corruption. As a result of a long process of uh, building these institutions, uh, political bargaining around nomination of their bosses and prolonged recruitment of the staff of, this, of these two bodies, uh, this, uh, these two anti-corruption uh, um, uh, institutions are, are still inoperative. Uh, um, and of course, the problem of, of corruption in Ukraine belongs to, what the, to the most important uh, challenges Ukraine faces today. Uh, this slide shows uh, Ukraine's main challenges. How to implement reforms uh, in a situation of uh, ongoing conflict with Russia and endemic corruption. Uh, third case, uh, Kiev um, undertook the reform of the judiciary, uh, the reform which after the, uh, the, um, the presidential election was, uh, was uh, called by the President Poroshenko 
the mother of all reforms. Uh, some laws uh, have been passed. Uh, two crucial are on the restoration of trust in the courts and on the prosecutor office. Uh, the changes so far have been going into good direction, I would say, but they are still insufficient and require more action, including an effective fight with corruption uh, in the courts themselves. Moreover, uh, the reform has met a strong opposition from the, from the, um, uh, from the uh, judges. Uh, fourth uh, case, uh, gas reform has been initiated. <laughs> Um, and I believe it's one of the most important uh, reforms uh, as uh, if successfully implemented it will have an influence on um, uh, not only on the energy sector but also on uh, many other areas of, uh, of states functioning. For example, repairing the, the, the financial situation of NAFTA gas, uh, this is a, a Ukrainian gas um, a monopolist, uh, which generates uh, losses amounted to 7% of, of, uh, of Ukrainian GDP, would have a positive, uh, positive uh, uh, effect on public finances. Uh, improving energy efficiency, uh, which is now among the lowest in the world, and from this side you see how much energy need, Ukraine needs to produce one unit of GDP. It's three times more than in the case of Poland, Germany, on Great Britain. So you can't fix Ukrainian economy without fixing Ukrainian gas sector. Um, fifth, the new uh, government uh, launched some reforms in the economic sphere. Uh, most importantly, it has stabilized the macroeconomic situation, stopped the depreciation of hryvna, increased currency reserve, reserves, and partly reduced foreign debt thanks to the uh, agreement with uh, some Western creditors. Uh, uh, this was la largely um, possible thanks to the um, cooperation, Ukrainian cooperation with the IMF and uh, 70.5 uh, uh, billion US, US dollar billion aid program from, from the uh, International Monetary Fund. Uh, measures have also been taken to deregulate, um, deregulate the economy uh, and some changes in the tax system. But uh, there is no compre comprehensive uh, uh, approach from the, from the Ukrainian government side to improve the operating condition, especially for small and middle-sized Ukrainian company, which is you know, uh, uh, very necessary to, uh, to, um, to, to, to put Ukrainian economy on the path of, of, uh, of, of growth. Uh, I would say that actions uh, of the Ukrainian authorities in improving conditions for economic activities are, are well illustrated by the re recently published Doing Business report, which noticed improvement, improvement in just uh, three of ten uh, categories, categories which, which, which were studied. Um, so uh, what conclusions can be drawn from the post-Maidan uh, reforms? Uh, in normal circumstances, uh, the changes uh, introduced in the last almost two years would have to be regarded as a significant prog pro progress. But uh, the Ukrainian government is acting um, in an emergency situation uh, with an unfinished conflict with Russia, which is of course interested in a fiasco of a new Ukraine project. Uh, we see that in, in, in recent months, uh, uh, Ukrainian reforms have been um, introduced with more and more difficulties and growing resistance from, from a different interest group uh, who are not interested in, uh, in systemic modernization of, of Ukrainian economy, including uh, some, some oligarchs who are still uh, important political players uh, in Ukrainian uh, politics. Here you can see uh, 50 richest Ukrainian citizens controls half of Ukrainian GDP. Uh, in, in, in the case of Russia, 50 richest Russians control 17% of Russian GDP, and in case of, of the US, almost 5% uh, of the GDP. So uh, 
we see that it's a one more problem to solve how to reform Ukraine uh, with uh, so strong opposition from uh, from the from the oligarchs. Uh, a serious obstacle in the process of reforms is uh, often a visible uh, like lack of political will on the part of the authorities. After the Maidan, it was difficult to expect, of course, some reforming uh, miracles, uh, since only part of, uh, of the Ukrainian political aid was replaced. I think it's a crucial, it's a crucial um, um, element. Uh, we can't uh, expect uh, deep modernization with the same elite. And Ukrainian elite, it, it, to a large extent, is, all, is also is, is the same. Is the same. Um, what is really uh, important after after the revolution, there was no changes in the mechanism of Ukrainian politics. Uh, some part pa participants of uh, Ukrainian politics traditionally attempt to use their office uh, in building in building their own uh, business empires. Uh, which is still noticed, uh, especially uh, in the case of the current Ukrainian Prime Minister. Uh, this can also explain the lack of interest in a, in a fighting, real fighting with, uh, with corruption. Uh, although uh, anti-corruption body, um, uh, anti body have been created, there has no uh, breakthrough in this sphere. Mm, and the funding provided for them in the new budget are, are too low to make uh, fighting with corruption really uh, eff efficiency. Um, so, uh, therefore, the experience of, of last uh, almost two years shows that the, the, the reform process uh, is far from being completed. Uh, bringing uh, the Ukrainian state uh, to a healthy condition and thus getting, uh, getting rid of uh, post-Soviet mechanism and implementing European model, uh, it will be a long-lasting process that will require uh, firm actions not only from the, from the government, uh, but also some uh, assistance from, uh, from the West. Um, the lack of uh, expected results uh, from, from, the, from the reforms uh, provoke increasing frustration among uh, the, the public. And here you can see uh, uh, recent, uh, recent uh, polls. Uh, so currently 70% of Ukrainians believe that the, the, the country is going in the wrong direction. Uh, it is a similar result, as you can see also from this slide, it's a similar result as before the, as before the, the revolution, the second Ukrainian revolution. Uh, the fact that the, the, the public has no uh, felt any improvement, I think it's one of the biggest failure from the uh, post-Maidan um, uh, Ukrainian um, uh, government. Uh, the positive changes which have been already un undertaken uh, do not guarantee uh, the, the success of, of, uh, of Ukrainian reforms and uh, furthermore are not irreversible. Uh, it seems that in the coming months, a uh, condition for, uh, for reforming the state will be even harder uh, due to at least two factors. It's a inter growing internal conflict uh, inside Ukrainian ruling coalition, uh, but also growing impatience from the Ukrainian society. And there is also a third factor, which is uh, not yet complete, completely frozen uh, conflict in um, in Donbass. The combination of all these elements I mentioned uh, allows uh, the belief that the process of reforming Ukraine, uh, which has just uh, uh, begun, will take a long time. And I would say that uh, the, the, the outcome of this process is still unclear. Uh, of course, Ukrainian uh, government uh, should do more. I very much like the, the statement uh, U.S. Vice President Joe Biden made uh, a month ago in the Ukrainian parliament. Uh, he said, uh, it was, I, I truly believe it was a historic st statement, 
the, the whole his uh, the whole his speech in in in, in Verkhovna Rada. Uh, so he said, which is actually true, that the, the whole world is watching you, Ukrainians. Uh, 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 size the opportunity and uh, give an example to other nations in, on, on the post-Soviet area how to uh, effectively reform um, a post-Soviet model. Uh, how in this situation the West can help? Uh, what, in, 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 what could be recommended? I, um, I would focus on, on three points. The EU has to more engage in, in the reform process and needs more consistent approach. Analyzing the current uh, European uh, policy towards uh, its uh, eastern neighbors, we should notice limited EU's ability to, to influence situation uh, um, on this area. The ANP, European Neighborhood Policy, uh, failed to, uh, to meet uh, EU expectation in all key areas, like uh, political stability, democratic governance, economic transformation. Also, uh, for the sake of our uh, European interest, if we want to have a stable neighbors with a solid economy and a stable political system without mass migration and without security challenges, we should do more in uh, assisting in, um, uh, in Ukrainian reforms. Second, uh, the EU needs to uh, understand that transformation of uh, Eastern partners, post-Soviet states, has no analogies. Uh, I truly believe that the West um, makes often a mistake uh, because it tries to uh, compare transformation of Central uh, Europe countries with transformation of Eastern European countries, post-Soviet uh, states. But these two models uh, are very different. Polish, Slovak, Hungarian uh, transition experience in a bigger part, I believe, is uh, not relevant for, for example, Ukraine. Uh, trans transformation at the beginning of uh, 1990s, it was a transformation, I would say, simpler, more simple, because it was a transformation from a communist a model, central planning economy, to democracy, um, free market, we can call it altogether European model. In case of Ukraine or such a country like Moldova, for example, we are talking about transformation from post-communism, a highly corrupted oligarchic system with a badly functioning um, uh, capitalism to the, to, the, to the European model. And one more reason, uh, uh, at the beginning of the 90s, uh, Poles, uh, Slovak, Hungarians, we didn't have Russian factor. Russian factors matters in case of Ukrainian or Moldovan uh, transformation. And finally, if, if we really want to be effective, I'm, I'm talking about the EU approach, and have a power to uh, positively change Eastern partners, we have to be ready to pay cost of our policy, including uh, political costs in our relations with Russia. Uh, so I argue that uh, Ukraine needs a constant attention from the West, including persistent pressure on the Ukrainian government. Uh, without this, the chance uh, of a success of the post-Maidan Ukraine would significantly decrease, or um, uh, according to more optimistic scenario, uh, Ukrainians would have to wait much longer for, uh, for a successful uh, transformation. Okay, now I would like to switch to, uh, uh, to Ukrainian-Polish relations. Uh, let, me start, uh, let me start from, uh, from the thesis that uh, the last 25 years in Ukrainian-Polish uh, relations have been a success. Uh, to understand the scale of this success, we have to bear in mind that uh, between the end of the Second World War and the beginning of 1990s, when Ukraine became uh, an independent country, it was a frozen conflict in, to, in both nations' relations. In 1945, um, as a result uh, of, of, of Yalta Conference, Poland lost uh, its eastern territories, including, um, including um, Eastern Galicia, 
which was given to, uh, to, to Soviet Ukraine. Uh, then we lost also uh, um, the city of Lviv, Lviv uh, uh, for Poles, one of the, one of the brightest uh, points on the map of Polish cultural, science, political life. Uh, when almost 50 years later, uh, Polish-Ukrainian relations were unfrozen, uh, Poland was the first country to recognize um, Ukrainian uh, independence. It means that uh, Warsaw had no territorial claims, uh, which, of, which of course was a, was a very good start of, of a new relations. Uh, to a large extent, uh, this miracle, and I think that, mi the, the, that the word miracle here is, is, is a justified word, uh, so for this miracle, uh, the, Polish, uh, the Polish emigration uh, circles uh, were at least partly responsible, um, especially the French-based Cultura Monthly, uh, who since the, the 1950s started to wrote that, uh, that, uh, that the Poles had to accept its new borders, which was of course very painful then for, uh, for this generation of, of, of Poles. Uh, Kultura also works out a new concept of, uh, of Polish foreign policy towards its Easter, Easter uh, neighbors. Um, of course, it was rather a wishful thinking in the 1950s, 1960s, or, or even 90, 1980s, when uh, Polish emigration circles had no influence on, uh, on, communist, po on communist Poland. But after uh, 1989, this uh, wishful thinking these emigration and the ideas and concepts uh, were incorporated uh, as a cornerstones of uh, new Poland's foreign policy. Uh, and from the very begin beginning, uh, Ukraine um, occupies a very special place in, uh, in this new uh, strategy of Polish foreign, foreign policy. Uh, after the collapse of communism, uh, Poland and, and, and Ukraine have, have declared very close cooperation, which, uh, which have started to be called a strategic partnership. And what is important, no matters, uh, no matters what political party was in power in Poland or Ukraine after 1991, bilateral relations have always been rated as good. Uh, for Poland's uh, independent Ukraine, to some extent, was a, a guarantor of, uh, of Polish independence uh, to feel safe and due to Polish geography uh, it means uh, mainly safe from Russia uh, we need uh, and we still need a stable democratic and pro-European countries between us and Russia uh, so therefore um, from the beginning of 1990s Warsaw uh, uh, has been a keen supporter of Ukraine on the international arena, including uh, its European ambition. And paradoxically, I would like to show you polls made just before the Maidan. Paradoxically, more polls than Ukrainians supported European integration of Ukraine. Uh, in December 2013, 58% of polls thought it would be a good idea if Ukraine joined the EU. And uh, just 50%, or well, as far as much as 50% Ukraine, Ukrainians thought then it would be a good idea to join the EU. At the same time, one set uh, of Ukrainians thought it would be good a good idea to integrate with Russia by custom union, and only 8% of Poles uh, thought it would be a good idea for Ukraine to integrate with this Russian backed, uh, Russian -backed uh, uh, integration structure. So, indeed, a paradox. Uh, usually, Poland supported Ukraine uh, without any preconditions. Uh, thanks to, to good relations between our uh, political elites from the very beginning, um, uh, for example, President uh, Kwasniewski could be a negotiator during uh, the first Ukrainian revolution in 2004, and uh, during the second revolution, our then uh, Foreign Minister Radek Sikorski uh, was a uh, negotiator between the, the president and the opposition. However, uh, in spite of all, all, all this uh, strategic partnership idea, 
uh, I think that the, the potential of our bilateral relations has, been, has not been full, fully uh, exploited. There are, few, there are few reasons for, 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 for this. I will name just a uh, just, uh, uh, few of them. Uh, uh, it is asymmetry in, in Polish-Ukrainian relations, asymmetry of, uh, of potentials, asymmetry of political will, and asymmetry of interest. Uh, we have to remember that after 1991, uh, Poland and Ukraine have taken different paths different parts of, uh, of development. Uh, Poland managed to implement painful reforms uh, and became a member of Western organizations. Uh, and Ukraine became, a, um, we, can, we can call it uh, oligarchic democracy, uh, with all the problems uh, I mentioned before. Uh, and uh, probably the crucial factor is that in the last decades, Ukraine de facto was uh, unable to modernize itself. Uh, I, would like you, I would like to show you three slides which perfectly show this uh, asymmetry between Poland and in Ukraine. Mm. It's a uh, Polish and Ukrainian GDP uh, in last 24 years. Our starting point at the beginning of 90s was the same. Poland and Ukraine was on the, on the same, uh, our GDP was actually the same. As you can see, uh, Polish GDP is now three times higher than then, and Ukraine, Ukraine's GDP is on the level of two-thirds of 1991 level GDP. Uh, here you can see Pol Polish and Ukraine GDP uh, in 2014. <coughs> uh, Polish GDP is four times higher than, than, than Ukrainian. And finally, uh, Polish and Ukraine export for for uh, for first eleven months uh, of the in, in the previous year. So uh, uh, Polish export is uh, as much as five times five times higher than uh, than uh, than uh, Ukrainian. So obviously, Ukraine pays a, a very high cost of, of, for lack of reforms or imitation of reforms. Asymmetry of political will. Uh, from, from the very beginning, uh, there were differences in how Poland and Ukraine invested uh, in, a, in, in our mutual relations. Uh, Warsaw tries to develop people-to-people -people contacts, uh, help in reforms and Europe, uh, Europeanization of Ukraine, uh, lobbying Ukraine's interests uh, in, in, in the West, etc. In Ukraine's perception uh, of Poland, is very uh, mm, uh, Ukraine see Poland as very important and friendly partner, a neighbor, but partner, uh, one of one of very very one of few important uh, Ukrainian partners uh, in the West. Uh, Kiev uh, appreciated uh, the Polish role in lobbying Ukrainian interest uh, in the West. And especially uh, Polish role uh, as its uh, front in crisis. Uh, when there are some troubles uh, in Ukraine, usually there is a call from, from Kiev to, to, to Warsaw, please help us. Um, um, the, 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 the approach of many Ukrainian top politicians uh, was as follows. Uh, Poland has no other choice but to, to support Ukraine because it is uh, part of Polish national interest to support Ukraine. Uh, they always, I mean, Ukrainian politicians always like to repeat a slogan that there is no independent Poland without independent um, uh, Ukraine. Perhaps partly it's, it's true, but only uh, partly. Uh, okay, a symmetry of interest. Uh, mm, traditionally, uh, Ukraine is a, uh, is a important front, pa front uh, page, page issue in Polish media. Uh, the, the situation in Ukraine is usually uh, a subject of many studies, surveys, books. Uh, in Ukraine, just the opposite. There is a little information about Poland and very little political experts who, who, who deal with, with, with Polish. I will give an example of my institute, uh, Center for Eastern Studies in Warsaw. We have uh, at 
four or five experts who on a daily basis deal with uh, Ukraine. Uh, honestly speaking, I would have a, um, a problem to, to name you a uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, expert who eight hours a day deal with, with Poland. Uh, finally, social dimension of Polish-Ukrainian relations. Um, I would like to start from, from, this, from this slide. Uh, again, uh, uh, polls made uh, in November 2015, as you can see, uh, Poland is the most like country in Ukraine, and Russia is the least like. Uh, just 8% uh, of Ukrainians have negative feelings towards Poland. Also, uh, Poles have warm feelings towards Ukraine, uh, mm, but the level of the sympathy is, is, is a bit lower. According to the uh, uh, recent polls made like uh, 10 months ago, 40% uh, of Poles have warm or very warm attitude towards Ukraine. A new dimension of our uh, relations is uh, Ukrainian labor migration to, to Poland. Uh, the period uh, after the Maidan revolution brought a, a rapid rise in number of Ukrainians uh, migrating to the EU, uh, mainly to, to Poland. Uh, currently, uh, according to, um, to, 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 to our estimation, about half a million uh, Ukrainians work, and, uh, work in Poland, and uh, majority of them work uh, legally. Uh, such, such a significant, uh, significant uh, rise in, in Ukrainian uh, migration is mainly, of course, the consequence of e economic crisis in Ukraine, <laughs> as well as uh, a war in Donbass. Uh, I think that Ukrainians prefer Poland uh, due to at least five, uh, five reasons. It's geography, it's a stable growth of Polish economy, um, it's a simplified procedure of access to the job market, Polish job market, uh, l relatively large demand for workers and uh, language and, and, and cultural similarity. Once again, uh, a pool. Uh, it's a knowledge of Polish uh, language in Ukrainian regions. Uh, according to this pool, uh, one third uh, uh, of, uh, of Ukrainians uh, believe that he or she is able to, to communicate in Polish. Uh, just so if you give me two more minutes, uh, I will just uh, now stop for, for at least one minute at the issue of history influence on, uh, on our uh, relations. Uh, dispute over history is actually the most important and the hardest to resolve problem between Poland and Ukraine. Uh, so there are problems in Polish-Ukrainian uh, relations. Uh, mm, the most challenging dispute between, uh, between Poles and, and Ukrainian, Ukrainians concerns the assessment of uh, ethnic cleansing carried out in Germany-occupied uh, Volynia uh, region by the UPA, Ukrainian insurgent uh, uh, army, in 1943 and 1944. Uh, mm, here, you can see, here, here you can see where, where this region is, is, is located. So it's a Polish-Ukrainian borderland. Uh, so just to remind, uh, um, the, the UPA uh, actions against civilian uh, Poles resulted in around 100,000 deaths, and there is a broad consensus among Polish historians uh, that the, the crime should be classified as a, as a genocide. The majority of Ukrainian uh, historians claim that the events in, in, in Volynia uh, were just a, a, civil, a civil war. So uh, no doubt that uh, the, the Polish-Ukrainian historic contradiction is uh, much easier to settle than, for example, Ukrainian-Russian or even Polish-Russian, but nevertheless, history remains the, the key threat for, uh, for the future of our, uh, our relations. Uh, uh, I I would, it would be very, very difficult to, to sum up of this presentation. Uh, I think that may, my main task uh, today was to was to give you some arguments why uh, why Ukraine, in spite of many problems uh, post Maidan Ukraine faces, why Ukraine uh, matters for for Poland, and why it should matters for for the rest of Europe. Uh, 
Ukrainian society is one of the most pro-European uh, societies uh, on, in, in, in Europe. And uh, I believe that uh, the, you should answer this demand from, uh, from, uh, from Ukrainians. Uh, without uh, without uh, more European engagement, uh, Ukraine's chance for successful modernization would be in danger. Uh, I believe that without our uh, constant, uh, consistent assistance, um, it would be extremely difficult uh, for Ukraine to repeat successful modernization, for example, Poland or other uh, Central European countries. Uh, okay, I will stop here. Thank okay. you very much. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> Andrew. Thanks. Um, I'll try and stick to five minutes. Um, there's a wealth of detail here, um, uh, particularly in the graphs. I do like a good graph, which uh, not only do they look good, but they tell us important things about key questions, some of which we can expand on in the broader discussion. Um, but I'll come over all prefessorial uh, and raise the question of whether I heard an answer to the question. Um, it, why Ukraine matters to Poland and the EU? I mean, it's reasonably obvious why it matters to Poland. Less so why it matters to the EU. The answer isn't necessarily obvious and certainly needs justifying. Uh, but drawing out from some of the things you said, well, it's, well, six reasons is a, a reasonable round number. Uh, as you said, Ukrainian public opinion is now one of the most pro-European uh, on the continent. So firstly, pe pe people should not suffer for being pro-European. Firstly, that's, well, above and be uh, first and foremost, that's a moral question. Um, but secondly, it's um, a pragmatic rail policy question as well. If people are literally um, attacked for waving European flags, um, which is basically what happened in the Maidan and after, um, uh, and, if per and if Ukraine, if Europe is unable to protect Ukraine as a consequence, then its credibility in the broader world is shot. Um, and it's clear that its policy instruments, like the Eastern Partnership, don't work either. Third, Ukraine's been attacked. I'll keep that sentence short, because it's simple and culpability is clear. So there's a moral right to defend it. Uh, fourth, um, stopping Russia more generally is clearly important. Uh, Russia is clearly a broader threat than simply being a threat to Ukraine. In particular, fifth, Russia is a spoiler power. I, I found particularly interesting this discussion about late transformation being more difficult because it's transformation from post-communism rather than mm -hmm. from communism. So if that's not possible, um, then that is a really depressing me message to a whole number of post-communist countries. Um, it basically means that Russia is the anti-Obama. Um, if you remember Obama's slogan on his original election was, yes, you can. Yes, we can. So Russia's message to its neighbours is, no, you can't. Um, <laughs> sixth, um, bear with me. I mean, Ukraine, I mean, Europe is sclerotic. It's um, gridlocked. Uh, it has all sorts of problems. Potentially, Ukraine is not a direct solution to these problems. It's not a recipe for others, necessarily, but it represents the kind of spirit of solution. You have protest, you have elan, you have idealism. Um, so it's very important that that succeeds. And that I'm actually involved in a project in Spain, which, look, which sounds completely hopeless, trying to convince Spanish hipsters, people in Podemos or whatever, that um, the Ukrainian reformers are like them. Right? They're young and they have idealism and they want to change old Europe for the better. Um, that sounds like an impossible sell, but I believe it's logical. Um, that's six. Obviously avoiding the negatives, um, collapse, mass migration, etc. It's hugely important as well. 
Um, that said, there's a huge case against uh, reasons why Europe should not care, particularly if Ukraine is incapable of getting its own act together. Um, you said more about Poland, but to quick word about Poland and Ukraine too. Um, ironically, before the elections, the Polish elections, Poland was feeling somewhat aggrieved, quite rightly I think, that it was excluded from uh, the main diplomatic process over Ukraine, the so-called Normandy format, um, basically led by Germany mm. and France. Not quite sure what France was doing, so basically led by Germany. <laughs> um, precisely because Poland has been a very good foreign policy solidarity player, to use a favourite Polish word, um, which are, is now under threat. Um, Peace is an anti-Russian party, but... As well as civic platform was. <laughs> sure, 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 but it's more anti-Russian. But there are dangers in being an inward-looking nationalist Poland, because this is precisely the time when uh, solidarity foreign policy is precisely what's needed. Poland should be part of um, that broader front of European support for Ukraine. And, particularly to finish where you finished... This is a, a particular moment where Ukraine is in danger uh, of also becoming a bit more nationalist and getting its history wrong. Uh, so it's precisely the kind of moment when you should be helping them get it right. And that includes Polish-Ukrainian history too. Um, so I'm slightly worried about the new Poland, uh, but I'm a lot more worried about the new Ukraine. Yeah. <clears throat>